so how many of you have seen the film Casablanca out of curiosity? Excellent. Um, what I'm going to do is ruin that film for you tonight. Um, you're going to find out that everything you thought you knew about the Second World War in North Africa was actually quite false, um, with the exception of a couple of small ingredients that I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, but in overall, today I'm going to be discussing a place and a period of increasing scholarly and popular interest, and that is Jews in North Africa during the Second World War. It's going to be a fairly broad introduction to the topic, and I'm really happy to go in depth um, during the Q&A on any given topic that you might find interesting. But overall, I have two major arguments for this talk. One pertains to the Jews of North Africa itself, and the other pertains to the diversity of Jewish experiences in North Africa, including the Ashkenazi Jewish refugees, such as those referenced in the 1943 film Casablanca. My first central argument for this talk is that Vichy rule, um, the French regime that was propped up by the Nazis after France's loss in the summer of 1940, represented a profound betrayal to the Jews of North Africa. In North Africa, most Jews had come to identify with France for a number of different reasons, um, through French language, through French language education programs, through the Alliance Israelite Universelle, and other French colonial initiatives. France had, after all, colonized Algeria starting in 1830 and established protectorates over Tunisia and Morocco in 1881 and 1912, respectively. In Algeria, most Jews were even French citizens as of 1870, pursuant to a law known as the Crémieux Decree that I'll come back to a little bit later. In Morocco and Tunisia, Jews did not have French citizenship. However, there was an enormous all of which would serve to make the Vichy period an extraordinary moment of betrayal. All of these ideas apart experiences. The experiences of Jews from North Africa for multiple generations in North Africa differed tremendously from those of the Ashkenazi Jewish refugees who transited through North Africa. And those are the figures that you see a little bit in the film. They're never overtly discussed. Um, if you can think back to the film, right, there are these characters that we see are trying to secure visas and trying to get out somehow. They're never overtly stated to be Jewish, right? Um, and there are some reasons for that. And that, that is one of the few grains of truth to the Casablanca film. Story. As to the romance and all the rest, I don't know. I can't vouch for that. But at least for the refugee population, there is some grain of truth to this. Here. But you've probably recognized this image, right? It's Humphrey Bogart on the set of Casablanca. And now I'm about to ruin this entire film. All right. But in order to appreciate all of these, um, we have to go back a little bit into the French Revolution, actually. Um, you probably weren't expecting to discuss the French Revolution tonight, and I'm sorry, but here we go. Um, but the French Revolution in 1789 is really critical for understanding and foregrounding the difficulties that Jews in North Africa faced under Vichy rule. After all, the French Revolution of 1789 solidified and institutionalized a new concept of Jewish citizens, right? Jews became emancipated in France. They became full citizens of France. Rather than subjects, they were supposed to be equal Frenchmen to all other Frenchmen in France. And that foregrounding is really critical to understand that later betrayal. Um, after all, in the French Revolution, right, this is where we have the notions of liberté, égalité, fraternité, right, liberty, equality, brotherhood, right, that sort of universalist, capacious understanding of the belonging of a citizenship to a nation state. That revolution as well came the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man, also completed in 1789. That declaration famously proclaimed the right of all citizens to participate in the affairs of government. Special concessions for nobles, the church, and other sorts of special interest groups were abolished in the name of a sort of equalizing sense of citizenship, and that held true for autonomous communal rights for Jews as well. The Sephardi population of France were first to be emancipated. That took place in 1790. In 1791, all of the Jews, including the Nazi population, were emancipated. 
And the fundamental argument for this was well encapsulated by Count Clermont-Tonnerre's famous statement, which many of you may have encountered before, which is the following. The Jews should be denied everything as a nation, as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. They must disown their judges. They must have only ours, ours meaning the French states. They must be refused legal protection for the maintenance of the supposed laws of their Jewish corporations. They must constitute neither a state, nor a political core, nor an order. They must individually become citizens, right? That's the emancipatory bargain. You sacrifice communal, autonomous Jewish collective rights in favor of an individualized sense of citizenship to the French state in this case. Related to this phenomenon came an organization um, known as the Alliance Israelite Universelle. And I did not, I just wrote the acronym here, AIU, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, the Universal Alliance of Jews, basically. And it was founded in 1860 in Paris. And it's the first generation of French emancipated Jews, the zeal of civic participation that really drives them to found this organization in conjunction with a few incidents that take place around the Mediterranean. The first one is the 1840 blood libel of Damascus, which encourages um, philanthropic minded Jews of Europe to start thinking about intervening on behalf of Jews of North Africa and the Middle East. And the second major incident is the 18 Garda Mortera kidnapping in which an Italian child um, was baptized and removed from his home. So these two incidents, plus riding on this wave of emancipatory zeal, encouraged French Jews to want to extend that paradigm of citizenship, the benefits as they saw it of citizenship to the Jewish populations of North Africa and the Middle East. The motto of the Alliance was, as you see here, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zelazer. All Jews are responsible for one another. And you see it, right? It might be a little hard to see, but you see these two hands shaking in front of the doors, right? That idea of solidarity across Jews from Europe to North Africa and the Middle East. And the way this was all going to be carried out was through schooling, um, through large-scale education initiatives. The first Alliance school was set up in Tetouan in northern Morocco in 1862. And the idea was to take students, um, take the most gifted students, they would receive training in France and then be sent back out into North Africa and the Middle East, not to their home countries or very rarely to their home countries, but to some and spread that Alliance vision. The language of instruction was primarily French, which is odd. The idea of the Alliance was to make Jews the full emancipated citizens of their home countries. Those home countries usually spoke Arabic or Turkish or Farsi or other languages that were not French in their daily lives. So it was an odd tension right off the bat that the Alliance created, right? Creating citizens of the eventual emancipated nation state through a French prism. There were some Hebrew education across the Alliance system, but it was very inconsistent um, in quality. And, and most local languages were only taught much later in the Alliance's life into the 20th century. And things like Judeo-Spanish, also known as Ladino, were often negatively referred to as jargon, right? As some sort of backward language that the Jews must be separated from to earn or achieve those rights of citizenship. By the end of the 20th, or by the beginning, I'm sorry, of the 20th century, there were over 100 Alliance schools, which you can see on this, with about 26,000 students extending all the way from Morocco to Iran. And the idea was that these students would serve as agents of modernity. That the students, in some ways, would participate in what was known as the mission civilisatrice, or the civilizing mission. It was not very, it's, it's differently expressed through similar in tone to the French colonial and even British colonial understanding of a civilizing mission. The sort of arrogant perspective that one was intervening in the lives of Jews in a country or anybody in a country to better them for some particular way. 
And you can see it's sort of exemplified here in this photo, right? We have, this is the end of the 19th century. I believe it's a Jewish school, um, an Alliance school in Libya, um, wearing largely Victorian dress, sort of expressing the outward signs of French acculturation and assimilation, which at that time is understood to just be civilization. And I'll read you a quote. This comes from Aaron Rodrigue's um, source reader of a bunch of letters from Alliance Israeli schools. And this is a letter from an Alliance school in Tunisia, in Tunis, in 1908. And the teacher, who is themselves from North Africa, writes to headquarters in Paris the following. In the young Jew of the Hara, the Hara is the Jewish quarter, whose ancestors have left him as an inheritance, only the precious ability to endure suffering and privation with fortitude must be instilled all the dictates of the innermost conscience of a free man born of free parents. The human plant has not fared well in the shadows of the Hara. Its body thick and fleshy, its back bent, its constitution arthritic or neurasthenic. It is time for regeneration. The idea of, re I mean, maybe you understand this, but it's a deeply insulting picture in many ways for modern insensibility, comparing somebody to a plant, right? Regeneration of the human plant, not really conscious or appreciative of the context from which this plant has grown, um, but seeing this need to form, shape, adapt the plant for the needs of civilization, or at least that understanding of civilization. Alliance's brand of Mission Civilisatrice, or Civilizing Mission, as I said, dovetailed quite well with European colonial goals in the region. Um, as you see here, we have 1830 is when Algeria um, begins to become part of the French Empire. In 1881, Tunisia is established as a French protectorate, and Morocco becomes a French protectorate in 19. And at root, we see a very shared ideology wherein the French colonial authority would attention to the Jews in North Africa, grooming of citizenship that was very different from the way in which the French colonial apparatus handled subjects of the same colonial territories, creating very, very different experiences. I must say that Jews had a number of different political opinions really rejected French policy. Um, many of them bought into it wholeheartedly. And that illustrates this. Um, here's just a little bit of the Alliance. Um, so it's a class photo. Sorry for all the text. Um, this comes from Norman Stillman's reader, Jews of Arab Worlds and Modern Times. And this is a about a World War I um, Jewish soldier, a Jewish soldier from Tunisia who wanted to register to fight for France, had no reason to do so, right, as a total volunteer, could have just stayed home in Tunisia. Um, and I'll read the text out loud. It says, when the war broke out, Henri Bonan, of an honorable Jewish family originating in Algeria, that part's important, but long established in Tunis, could have pleaded in good faith his status as a Tunisian subject to remain in his villa by the seashore and not serve. He didn't have to go to the army. He didn't have to. He did not wait for his class to be called up and wanted to enlist as a volunteer. However, the office of the resident general, contesting the French citizenship of his father, Isaac Bonan, opposed in the name of the state and with a view toward the public interest, inscription on the recruitment lists. Anyone else rebuffed like this would have put aside his patriotic sentiments, his ardor, and his aspirations, and blamed the administration for the fact of not having been able to serve as he had so ardently desired. But Henri Bonan fought in court to obtain the right to serve. At his insistence, Mr. Isaac Bonan subpoenaed the resident general before the court of the first instance in Tunis, and later in his session of December uh, 7, 1914, rendering a decision declaring the plaintiff a French citizen. He then enlists. He went through the training school at Fontainebleau and was named as an officer cadet at the same time that he was accepted into the central school. He was just recently killed. At the age of 20, standing by his gun, facing the enemy for the motherland, which he had recently entered by force of law, he was decorated with the Croix de Guerre. And this is important for a number of different reasons. First of all, it's important that he has Algerian um, parents, because in Algeria, 
that granted most of those Jews citizenship. It was through those mechanisms that he could claim a French citizenship authoritative connection. But we see here also that he dies for France in the First World War, having had no need to do, to, need to do so. He's decorated with the, this cross, this honorary emblem. So he's really a sort of exemplary patriot of France in many ways, somebody who didn't have to do all these things, but chose to do them anyway to demonstrate a kind of patriotic zeal. And that's important to keep on the back burner. We're going to barrel ahead um, to this unfortunate and familiar fellow. As you all know, Hitler rises to power in 1933. And this would have profound consequences for the Jews of North Africa. At least today, I'm really only talking about North Africa. But there's some very interesting stories also about Jews in Iraq um, and many other places during this time period. And the kind of nationalism that Hitler and his ilk encouraged was one that was based on a kind of ethnocentric nationalism, virulent anti-Semitism, a sort of racial hierarchy, as you all know. In Germany, again, as you all know, the Nuremberg were instituted in 1935. German Jews were stripped of their citizenship, and many other um, exorbitant laws were meted against the Jewish community of Germany and as it would extend into later Jew um, German territory. Economic Aryanization took place. Um, Kristallnacht, notably, the, right, the Night of Broken Glass in November of 1938, resulted in Jews deciding to leave Germany. And of the places they went, many went into France and eventually would go into North Africa. Those are the places that you see in the film Casablanca. And once again, as the storm clouds of war began to gather in 1939, um, Jews from the French colonial holdings, as well as Jews from France proper, thronged to the French army. They volunteered in overwhelming numbers to fight against Nazi Germany. After all, they wanted to defend their France, the vision of France of the ideals of the French Revolution, of emancipated, emancipated liberal, universalist citizenship. Um, many of them were, however, rejected from volunteering in the army. Um, the colonial authorities in North Africa were afraid of agitating anti-Semitic uh, beliefs that were quite strong already in North Africa among the European settler colonials. And so most of these Jews were actually rejected. Um, just a quick refresher. Um, World War II, again, would present a fundamental sea change in this region. And as you know, the Axis powers represented Germany, Italy, and Japan, right? The Tripartite Pact. The Allied powers were France, Britain, and the USA, along with other affiliated states. And this war would do a number of different things. It would raise the stakes of political identification for everybody in the region, whether Jewish or Muslim or European. And for Jews, in particular those of North Africa, the promises that France had held out of emancipation and assimilation were severely compromised. Through generations that had been educated by the Alliance Israelite Universelle, that long multi-generational embrace of French language and French culture was ripped from them by the imposition of anti-Semitic legislation. The Algerian Jews lost their French citizenship entirely. Once France fell again to Vichy authorities, there were strict quotas imposed on Jews in school enrollment or certain kinds of occupation. There was even an initiative to force Jews to leave um, some of the newer apartment areas of the colonial areas of or other places and have them move back into the traditional quarters, the traditional Jewish quarters. And for Jews everywhere, this experience would sharpen a number of different political choices and trajectories, increasing allegiance, for example, to Zionism, or increasing allegiance to local forms of nationalism, or also communism. Um, all of these sorts of other national beliefs came to occupy a stronger position as a result of this Republican betrayal at the hands of Vichy France. Further, with the arrival of refugee Jews from Europe coming into North Africa, there would be no 
oath of solidarity across Jewish populations. Interestingly enough, whereas before it had been European Jews lending aid, so to speak, to North African Jews, during this time period, actually, be Moroccan Jews, Tunisian Jews, Algerian Jews, who were welcoming in European Jewish refugees into their homes, into their school systems, um, reciprocating and responding with another kind of solidarity that crossed the Mediterranean. For Muslims, um, particularly those in North Africa, the war demonstrated the weakness of France. And with that weakness of France came an opening for national liberation politics and the ability to agitate for those national liberation policies. Whereas Germany and Italy had tried to spread pro-fascist propaganda across North Africa, particularly in Spanish Morocco, um, it was generally not as well embraced as they had thought it would be. Uh, most Muslims were opposed to fascist. Muslims were inclined to remain in solidarity with their Jewish co-citizens across North Africa. When, North, when France fell to Germany in the June of 1940, protectorate regimes of Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria were replaced with Vichy officers and Vichy policies. And very quickly in October, just a few months after the fall of Republican France and the installation of Vichy France, and the Vichy regime began to enact various legislation within proper France as well as across North Africa um, that was very much Algerian Jews citizenship. Again, legislation to compel Jews to move into the crowded traditional Jewish quarters and having Jews leave their educations right in the middle of it, their careers, um, their schools, total disruption of life across the board. This had been part of a larger plan. Uh, Nazi officials had, in fact, included North African Jews in their calculations for the quote, final the Von C conference of January of 1942. Germany had hoped, after all, to Cairo across the Middle East and North Africa in its desire to gain territory for Lebensraum, right, the living space of the German. And in order to do that, they would have to affect policies against the Jews that they encountered as well. So the Von C country list, in fact, listed far more Jews than it listed for France about 700,000 Jews, which wasn't true, right? France itself only contained about 200,000 Jew and Jews, and those extra thousands came from the North African territories in those very calculations. So the way this took place in North Africa was very interesting. There were forced labor camps, but I have to say that's very different from either about Central Europe or Poland or anywhere else during the Holocaust. It is not a system of death camps. It is not a system of camps that you might imagine in this other world. Um, but what happened instead was they were forced labor camps that were predicated on the extraction and exploitation colonial industries that were already in existence in um, North Africa. And here you can see a, a few of those laws. Here are some of the camps. Um, uh, this is a map from Robert Satlock's book about um, see um, a series of, map, of dots showing where the prospective camps and some of the actual camps were, according to German cartographers. And one of these exploitive industries came the Trans-Saharan Railway. This was a project that the French colonial elites had wanted to enact well before the establishment of the Vichy regime. As you can be a little fuzzy, um, the idea was to create a railroad for exploitation of phosphates or other mining resources from French North African territories, put them on a railway, send them to Oran in Algeria, and then ship them across the Mediterranean to the port enriching France and um, subsequently also Nazi Germany in this case. And finally, with the Vichy period, the colonial elites had the manpower to enact this policy. They took um, incarcerated political undesirables that were interned in forced labor camps across Morocco and Algeria to work on this railroad, to build the very railroad tracks. There were about 7,000 prisoners who worked in these camps and on these projects, and about a third of them were Jewish, building this particular railroad and other things. And I have to say, it's important to recognize that the Jews that I'm talking about here that were put in camps are not 
the indigenous local North African Jews. Those would be the Jewish refugees who were suspect for communist political beliefs or other politically undesirable beliefs. These were European majority, as well as Spanish Civil War refugees, um, anti-Nazi agitators of all different stripes, mostly political undesirables who were in these camps, but not the Jews from North Africa themselves. The Jews from North Africa were subject to those anti-Semitic laws that I mentioned, but not placed in these camps, with the exception of Tunisia, which I'll get to in a little bit. Very tragically, many of the internees in these camps had been volunteers for France, had fought in either the First World War or the 1939 campaign for France. Um, and one eyewitness from the camp, Maurice Vaninovanikov, uh, visited the camps and said the following, quote, contrary to all logic, the fact of these foreign volunteers having served France in a moment of danger was held against them. The foreigners who had stayed calmly at home and worked for profit led lives free from worry and inconvenience, while those who rose to defend their second home were judged as suspects in, Mor in Morocco, treated more or less as pariahs. So think back again to that World War I soldier from Tunisia that I mentioned, right? He did not have to register. He didn't have to do any of these things. He died in the attempt to defend France. And that very same category of population was often in turn in these camps in particular, often still wearing their uniforms or their coats being interned by the very nation that they had rose to defend. The same, um, the same percentage, right, 90% of them, let's see, were volunteers. It, um, Vanino Vanikov wrote prisoners subject to about 10 hard um, and other hot or Sundays of Christian um, background prisoners. They were given very, very insufficient food, very insufficient um, shelter, very limited access to hygiene as well. So these are certainly not the labor camps of Nazi Germany, but these are also very, very harsh circumstances. Um, I had the opportunity to 2009 and in 2010, so I'm going to take a moment to share with you some of those campsites before moving on um, into what happens more historically. Um, here you see a, a photograph from the time. This is in Vanino Van text uh, of the time. It says, in Africa, on the, the railroad, the Trans-Saharan Railroad. You can see workers on it. And this is a photograph I took of that same railroad um, in 2009. And this is in the town of Belgien in particular. This is, was um, the site of one of the nearly entirely Jewish, actually, uh, forced labor camps. And you can see here the railroad tracks are still very much visible. Um, there's a Jewish cemetery that you can see there. There's a tombstone. There are a few other tombstones as well. Uh, the infrastructure of the camps still remains, right? This was probably um, a station to receive the prisoners right adjacent to the railroad tracks the inside of that um, building. And then you take, I mean, these are all, again, back on that map, stretching along Morocco's border with Algeria, sort of driving south with this. The next camp was Tendrara. Tendrara is probably the best preserved of all of these camps. And at this point, it's almost been 10 years since I was there. So I don't know what state it is in now. But I know Morocco is taking an active interest in preserving this history. So we'll see what happens to these sites eventually. But Tendrara really gives you the fullest picture of what the campsites were like. You see the railroad tracks. You see a sort of water tower and cistern here. It might be a little hard to see, but you can see some barbed wire in the foreground here. Generally, it would be, um, the prisoners would not be in these buildings. The prisoners would be in these very flimsy tents for housing. Um, but it would be the supervisors who were in um, the camp buildings themselves. You see some barbed wire. I mean, it's a very eerie place, very extensive sort of site inside of one of those buildings. I mean, it's hard to conjure the entire atmosphere here. And you can see this is um, one of the examples was all over the camp. The tiles themselves had these odd heart-shaped patterns on them. It's kind of strange. Heart tiles amid a place of suffering. I mean, see the fracture of one of these tiles here. Kind of camp. Um, Arafa was actually the end of the railroad 
itself, um, Buarafa formed a sort of constellation of camps. Around Buarafa were some punishment camps, as they were known, for the especially refractory prisoners. Um, but most of these satellite camps were devoted to mining um, raw materials for the French Empire. You can see it sort of it blends into the mountains, but it's a very, this was more of a mining camp. And you can see it's a very different kind of temporary set of structures. Um, very different sort of style. And that same guy, uh, Maurice Vanino Wanikoff, he toured these camps and the service of the Red Cross. He said that in Buarfa itself, there were a little under a thousand people who were interned in that one camp, at least as of July of 1942. And in many of these camps, we see, especially the punishment camps, um, a kind of punishment known as tombeau, which if you speak French means tomb. Um, it literally translates to tomb. And the idea is that a prisoner would dig sort of a um, coffin-sized hole in the ground and lie in it, subject to all sorts of weather conditions um, for an indeterminate number of days, despite the weather conditions. Um, I've read many documents subject that after um, the liberation of these camps, many of the people who were subjected to that particular form of punishment um, suffered amputations, lifelong health complications, um, all sorts of things from this. In Algeria, uh, which was the most loyal place in many ways to this idea of French Jewish identity, um, most throughout the Vichy period loyal to an idea version of France, sort of true France and not the temporary France that was taking shape around them. And here you have, um, this is a citation from a particular Jewish organization known as Kol Aviv in Michel Abit Bol's book. Um, this was the president of a university organization who in protest of the stripping of Algerian Jewish citizenship and the other anti-Semitic laws says the following. We are French, and we state loudly that even though it is possible to change a juridical status, meaning stripping Algerian Jews of their French citizenship, there is no power in this world that can affect the deep feeling that unites us to our country, to its, to its dead. But we are also Jews. We must admit, for many of us, it is only since we have been so marked that we and this attribute of Jewishness has appeared at first as an undeserved burden imposed on us a bothersome label. Forced by circumstances, we have been led to introspection. We have wondered if behind these more or less arbitrary classifications there was not something else. We have wondered if we should content ourselves with rejecting the label, with showing only that we are French, or, on the contrary, we should look for lost roots. And, to give a deeper answer to unjust accusations, find in Jewish culture the possibilities for spiritual enrichment. And this is what I mean about the challenging of Jewish political beliefs in this time period as well. I mean, what he's essentially saying here is, shall we maintain our loyalty to France? Or is that the wrong political trajectory after all? Has this moment proved a sort of breaking point or watershed moment in Algerian Jewish political consciousness? Another organization in Algeria organized very politically and said, we want neither a national Jewish state, they rejected Zionism, nor separationism, nor any sort of particularism. Deeply and intensely maintain the same attachment to the idea of France, to the French community. It's terrible that the hardship we are enduring has been rationalized with the pretext that Jews cannot assimilate. We must do everything for assimilation, for a closer adaptation of the French Jew to the French motherland. We are certain that we will end up by being heard and being convincing. Right? This aspiration, again, to cling to France. Um, and this is more or less how the polit political trajectory is going until November of 1942, when we have Operation Torch. Operation Torch, as you may know, is the moment when Allied forces of the Americans mostly, as well as the British, pushed through the Mediterranean, landing first in Morocco and um, ultimately in Tunisia eventually, um, making a sort of sweep upward through the Mediterranean. Here you can see some of the landings themselves in Casablanca, also not featured in the film, right? We never see the bombs drop. Um, and here is, in fact, a description, a wonderful document from an on-the-ground observer at the bombardment of Casablanca. 
he's just this sort of affable American volunteer with a Quaker organization who has happened to be caught here. He says, the first thing I knew that things were beginning to happen was when the air raid sirens blew before daylight of November 8th. At first, I couldn't make out what they were blazing at. Then I saw a plane suddenly take what I thought was a nosedive, and I thought one had been hit when it suddenly started to level off, and I saw some bombs drop out and start down. Then I realized that it was a dive bomber attack. I looked further up, and there was a whole line of these planes headed for the port. I saw one ship struck, and in no time, the whole port seemed covered with bomb bursts. And from the dense clouds of smoke which appeared almost immediately, it looked like a tremendous fire had been started. At about the same time, anti-aircraft bursts were getting higher in the sky. To see a ship struck that way was one a rather sick explosions during the forenoon with planes flying over. It was perfectly clear that the Americans had had very heavy forces available from the character of the attack on the port. So I was simply flabbergasted when people told me that a very small French fleet had gone out to fight them. It was worse than suicide. Um, so this, of course, inaugurates Operation Torch. And while Morocco and Algeria were initially liberated, things took a much greater turn for the worse in Tunisia. In response to Operation Torch, the German forces directly occupied Tunisia for a matter of six months, with even more for the Jews living there. Um, in Tunisia, you can see the great mountain in Tunisia. Um, German propaganda very quickly unleashed a threat, um, a series of statements that Jews were in fact to blame for any woes befalling Tunisia. Um, saying the following, right, these are the Foreman pamphlets translated into Arabic. There as elsewhere in one way or another, the Jews supremacy by imposing a liberal democratic system that weakens the feeling of nationality and race in the people and allows the Jews to become the undisputed masters over persons and wealth thanks to their undeniable abilities for plunder, theft, and scheming. The Muslims, following the example of Europe, which has thrown the Jews overboard, must, as they have done in the past, relegate the Jews to their mela, another word for a Jewish quarter. There is no solution for the welfare of the Arabo Berber people. The Muslims of North Africa are faced with a long term project requiring systematic preparations. If they really want it, they will be capable of great things. It is desirable that they work with European, i.e., German troops in order to succeed in this project. And in fact, Jews were required to join. Um, forced labor camps. They were interned in forced labor camps. They were required to register with a kind of Judenrat in Tunis. Eventually, though short on manpower, the Germans also had to enlist Tunisian Muslims, and they tried to backtrack on this justification about the Jews, saying, well, oh no, it's not that you're bad as, as bad as the Jews also. If you read this closely, right, it's the opportunity to serve the German nation. That's what's being offered here. So it's the same kind of forced labor that's also being imposed on the Muslims, but the sort of attempt of German propaganda to explain it away as actually serving in a very uh, brave and patriotic way. In Tunisia, about 5,000 Jewish laborers were conscripted in those forced labor um, camps. They were also subject to communal fines um, by the Nazi authorities as well. And as Expect in those work camps as well as horrible health conditions, lack of access to food, medical care, all of these sorts of things. Um, you can see here again an image. Here is a picture of a food stamp from the Tunisian Jewish community of that time as well. Eventually, Tunisia too was liberated in May of 1943, but for about six months, the Jews of Tunisia were subject to direct, brutal Nazi rule and direct, brutal anti-Semitic legislation that was harsher than that um, that had been imposed in North Africa by the Vichy regime in Morocco and Algeria as well. And in fact, it said that even um, there were even rumors of a possible crematorium being built in Tunisia as well. And there, those rumors were unsubstantiated, but we have to ask ourselves, the, the idea that those rumors were circulating in and of themselves is very indicative of the kind of fear and terror that the Jews felt, um, that the threat that they felt. So what is the aftermath of all of this? 
Um, so the camps were eventually liberated. They were liberated following Operation Torch. And in particular, um, organizations like the Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC, as well as High Hebrew Immigrant Aid Alliance, um, were very active in supplying refugee Jews in Morocco and Algeria with visas to ultimately get to the Americas, with work opportunities. Many of them worked for the Americans in military bases across North Africa before eventually going on to the Americas. And the person who was very um, instrumental in this was a Moroccan woman named Alain Cazès Benatar. And I recommend you invite Susan Gilson Miller to come speak here at one point, because she's doing a really tremendous project entirely about this woman and her work. But she was the mastermind of the refugee aid efforts and the visa transit efforts for those refugee Jews who were stuck in North Africa. She also lobbied for the rights of Jews in Morocco to regain their scholarship rights, their employment, all of these sorts of things as well. She was a very critical figure in all of this. Eventually, her committee was shut down. Her work became um, less necessary, particularly for that moment. But she went on to have an illustrious career um, within these sorts of aid networks. Those networks themselves, the JDC, highest with Hélène Cazès Benatal, were charter ships, um, a number of different ships that would come through Spain or through Portugal and stop um, in Morocco and then go on to the Americas, or Morocco to Spain and Portugal, and then on to the Americas eventually, but these were not easy trajectories. Sometimes people would be stuck in places like Senegal for six weeks before eventually moving on, so it's not a smooth um, process. And it took a very long time for both the camps to be liberated, the refugees to be handled, um, and for the Jews of North Africa to regain their legal and civil status even months, years after Operation Torch. And this is one person who is writing about the community in Mogador, also known as Esawira today, in 1942. Someone says, um, this is a reporter on the situation of Jews, says, in November of 1941, when I had questioned all the refugees to be informed of their situation, almost all refused aid of any kind, as most of them were expecting to leave shortly for the United States. However, their departure being definitely postponed and at present seemingly impossible, they are forced to exhaust their resources so that some of them are in difficult circumstances even though they state they were well off in the past, right? Not wanting to accept that kind of aid, right? There's a difficult psychology as well and even accepting that kind of help. So by way of conclusion, maybe I'll use this very, very this slide from the film itself. If you can't see it, it says, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, one of the biggest takeaways uh, from this entire moment, um, there was a rupture of esteem for France among North African Jews. The promises of 1789 in the Republic were broken and demonstrated the limits of French universalism, encouraging Jews to embrace other future political trajectories. The other major thing was the ascendance of U.S. policy in the region, and that's why I'm using this slide in particular. We can see that at play in the 1943 film Casablanca. That final scene that I'm showing here shows Rick Blaine, played by Humphrey Bogart, and Captain Louis Renault of the, the Vichy regime, who thwarted the Nazis to help Rick, and he says, I think this is the beginning it's at the moment of this movie's release we see the U.S. and the Free French working in closer collaboration and ultimately a fundamental transformation in U.S. relations in North Africa and the Middle East as well. As here we see President Roosevelt with the King of Morocco and some other dignitaries, including Winston Churchill. And the last slide I'm going to show you is this column. This is in a Jewish cemetery in Algeria. And it's a little hard to see, but I've given a translation here. You can see two versions of a French flag. It's written in Hebrew and in French. It says, the Jewish community of Oran, its children killed for France in the wars of 1914, 1918, comma, 1939 to 1945, and for the victims of Nazi barbarism. I guess the final conclusion is that truth is, in fact, stranger than fiction. What we do not see on this politicization of the anti-Semitic Vichy legislation that this here to, we have no sense that their citizenship was stripped despite this illustrious career of service in France. Um, the idea of Casablanca is so 
much more about all of these history. And I will end on that note, and I really look forward to hearing your questions and your comments. Thank you so much for your attention.